good evening everybody thank you all very much we have a very distinguished panel today for this uh, very unique webinar as you are aware we are progressing the underwater domain awareness framework uh, for safe secure sustainable growth in the indian ocean region and beyond i mean it's the tropical waters of the indo pacific region so i'm not going to take too much time uh, my colleague uh, nishtha vishwakarma is going to be conducting the uh, uh, webinar today uh, so i will straight away hand over to her nishtha all yours please thank take you. thank you so thank much you. sir uh, a very good evening to everyone uh, welcome all uh, welcome to the esteemed panel and everyone else who has joined us for this webinar today uh, i'm nishtha and I, I will be the one who will be conducting uh, the webinar today for you uh, i work at maritime research center as a communications and advocacy fellow uh, maritime research center is a technology driven think tank that is dedicated towards the promotion of underwater domain awareness framework uh, apart from looking after the outreach and communications initiatives at mrc i also look for after the uda digest e magazine which is a platform that allows us to bring together diverse views and thoughts in the form of short articles videos commentaries creative posts and more through this webinar we aim to bring together the experts and strategists across multiple domains to deliberate on this very important topic which is underwater domain awareness framework for effective blue frontiers in the indian ocean region now before we proceed i'd just like to before we proceed i'd uh, like to inform you all uh, something uh i would like to inform you that uh, about the sudden demise of uh, mrs rashmi arnav das i'd like to inform you about uh, mrs rashmi arnav das uh, mrs das was uh, director at maritime research center and ne dhwani technology she truly proved herself as the pillar and support to both the institutions her contribution as part of the leadership at mrc and ndt uh, will always be a source of uh, inspiration for all of us uh, kindly join us in observing a minute of silence and pray for the departed soul thank you the indian ocean region has attained significant strategic relevance in the 21st century for multiple reasons more and more global powers want to maintain their strategic presence in the region and claim their stake in the power play extra regional powers are increasingly deploying their maritime forces and research vessels in the region to ensure the political and military dominance Uh, so the major attempt to conduct this webinar is to identify the gaps and evolve synergy among stakeholders and policy makers across the region in this webinar we have some high ranking guests and we'd like to extend our thanks to all the panelists for joining us today before we proceed to the next section of the webinar i would like to give you some technical updates and know hows about the webinar dear panelists during the webinar please don't forget to switch on your microphones when it is your turn to speak to the audience we have audience joining us through the webex platform that we are currently at and some of our audience are watching our, watching this event through youtube uh, live streaming uh, section as well uh, we'd like to welcome all the audience who are present with us on the webinar today uh, it would be great if the panelists can keep the notes brief between the time range of 20 minutes for good and timely execution of the webinar uh at the end of the webinar we'd also extend we'll also allot like 10 to 15 minutes uh, to the q and a session after the panelists are done with their parts of the job uh thank you very much and i'd like to uh, wish good luck and good time to everyone who's present over here now i'd like to welcome our first esteemed guest we have with us ambassador anup kumar muktal uh anup uh, ambassador muktal has been a um, member of the indian foreign services and he retired from the services in may 2016 as the high commissioner to mauritius 
Uh, as part of his diplomatic career spanning 32 years, he has served thrice as, at the headquarters of the Ministry of External Affairs, handling relations between India's neighborhood. Ambassador Mukdal's uh, dom domain specialization includes uh, maritime security, defense, ocean economy, mainly blue economy, etc. Today, Ambassador Mukdal will be sharing some uh, opening, opening remarks with us on challenges and oppositions in the island nation. Now, I would like to call uh, Ambassador Mukdal to take over the stage and share his valuable thoughts with us. Thank you very much, Nisha. Uh, I would also want to thank Maritime Research Center for giving me this opportunity to share this platform with the galaxy of experts on ocean affairs. I do not really count myself as an expert in this field. Uh, I have been dealing with the ocean affairs, mainly the blue economy, as you mentioned, and the SDG issues uh, for almost now seven to eight years. In fact, in fact, I have been associated with the blue economy discourse in India right from the beginning, right from when we launched our initiative called Sagar, which is security and growth in the region for all, for all in the region. In fact, I was High Commissioner in Mauritius when Prime Minister launched this initiative, this important initiative, as to how India looks at the oceans, what kind of vision India has in terms of the ocean's role in its own development, and its cooperation in the region for development and growth for all. I have been a member of uh, Fiki Trans uh, Task Force on Blue Economy ever since its inception. I was also a member and still continue to be of the Steering Committee on Blue Economy under Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. And we have produced a, a series of documents on blue economy. Because when we started talking about blue economy, uh, our assumption was that we bring in business community into this discourse, we would not succeed in our objective of conservation effort when we deal with the oceans. Now, why we are talking about oceans or why we're talking about blue economy? Friends, I'm sure you all know that, you know, the, the humanity seeks growth because growth brings happiness and welfare for our species. Now, we have been doing it ever since our civilization got the, the skills of kind of uh, taking advantage of what the nature provides and converting that into uh, the utilities that the humanity then put to use for improving their own livelihoods. Now, ever since the Industrial Revolution, in fact, our capacity to take advantage, utilize the natural resources has undergone multiple, multiple uh, 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 so-called so -called force multiplier. For example, before the, the technologies, humans could only explore and exploit that much. But today, the technology gives us an opportunity and, and, and helps us to exploit those resources at a much, much faster rate. What's happening now as a result of this technology intervention we are convinced that we have overutilized and exploited the natural resources. But we still want to grow. We still want to grow. And therefore, in fact, now we are eyeing at expanding our economic activity into the oceans. Now, when I deal with blue economy, my worry is that let's look at our record of uh, dealing with natural resources on land. I think we have 
not been very wise uh, in dealing with exploitation of natural resources on land. And we look at the consequences. We have literally, we have literally destroyed our ecosystems on earth. The air is polluted, we can't even breathe in big cities. The water is polluted. The land is degraded. The forests have been, rather there is a massive deforestation. And uh, uh, the biodiversity has been badly affected. Now, if we want more, I think simply looking at the ocean and expanding our activity to the ocean without paying attention to the conservation part, I think, in my view, it could be an expansion of our mistake. Therefore, in blue economy discourse, while we look at the economic potential of the ocean, but we deeply emphasize the need for conservation, the health of the ocean. Now look at, we have always been using oceans for our economic benefits. We have used ocean for food, energy, transport, recreation, and now we are opening new fields. We call them non-conventional areas of ocean economy, be it the seabed mining or the ocean biotechnology or whatever we may call it, or the renewable energy, uh, various kinds of renewable energy. Now, ocean has always been there in supporting humanity. But the question is, have we supported the ocean? You see, if I give you this figure, there is something called the Earth's Overshoot Day. That's the day when we exploit our annual quota of Earth's resources. Uh, and this overshoot day normally every year falls somewhere in July and August, which means we, we finish the Earth's quota of resources, the resources which the planet can regenerate in normal course five months ahead of the year end. And for five months, we dig into the future resources of our planet. And we have been doing it for many, many decades. As a result, we see the consequences of our action on Earth's health or Earth's environment. Now, what, what is happening in ocean? Now, before we jump into expanding our, our activity further into the ocean, we need to see what is the health of the ocean. In fact, the ocean is already suffering from the, the human activity on land and in ocean. Now, ocean has uh, 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 pollution. There's, I'm sure you hear about plastic pollution, but that's not the only pollution. There's a massive amount of chemical pollution in that. Now, pollution, then we talk about acidification. Uh, then we talk about loss of biodiversity. And now we are talking about what is called uh, the temperature rise, which is part of our discourse on global warming. Now, all these issues, in fact, which we discussed tangible issues of uh, the implications of your deteriorating ocean health, but we sometimes miss out on the intangible contribution of the ocean. Now, look at, for example, when we talk about global warming and we talk about carbon sinks. Now, ocean, in my view, is the single largest carbon sink the nature has provided. Ocean absorbs almost one third of the carbon dioxide that we produce. Ocean produces almost half of the oxygen that we breathe. Ocean hosts a large amount of biodiversity. Now, and then, of course, more important, the ocean's control of the weather system. If the water cycle gets disturbed, then the implication of all oceans, bad health would not remain in ocean, it will be reflected on land also. So when I look at the ocean, while I look at huge amount of resources which can serve humanity well, but I am also worried because Dealing with ocean will be more difficult 
than dealing with land. Because land, at least you can see. The land is visible to you, which means whatever you do and whatever happens, you can see it. And still we have messed up the whole thing. Now in ocean, we can't even see it. Now, normally we say out of sight, out of mind. Now, if we go to the ocean blindfolded about the implications of our action on ocean health, believe me, we shall be inviting a disaster for mankind. Therefore, therefore, now the issue is we want to deal with the ocean for the benefits, but the question is, do we know the ocean? How would you take advantage of something which you do not even understand? I'm sure the scholars here are aware, but many of the ordinary listeners may not know that we have only understood and explored just about 5% of the ocean. We do not even know the ocean, right? We do not understand the biodiversity of the ocean. We do not understand the chemistry of the ocean. We do not understand the current movement of the ocean. We do not simply understand these crucial aspects and then their interaction with each other causing the consequences. Now, Arnab, I have dealt with blue economy issue for almost seven, eight years. While we have talked about the surface domain awareness regularly, but we have not adequately discussed the underwater domain of awareness. I remember when we discussed underwater domain awareness, it was discussed as part of the marine spatial planning. Because in marine spatial planning, we were all talking about what is called the protected zones. And how do you deal with protected zones unless you talk about underwater awareness? I think. Uh, uh, Arnab, you are doing a great service to the overall discourse uh, on blue economy because my worry is that surface domain awareness of ocean has limited application in terms of fully understanding the ocean. We are looking at the surface because that has direct implication for security. Security of the ocean, security of the uh, our uh, uh, shipping lanes. Uh, but the larger issue, the larger issue of blue economy and the larger issue of ocean's role in the overall conservation of earth ecosystems, I think that is much more important. And also that is much more complicated. You can see the surface, you can use all kinds of tools and understand the surface domain and as a result create, create awareness and share it. But what about underwater? We have not even started that process. We have not even started that process. I think uh, we need to Arna, push this idea because we need to start it now because we have already missed the date uh, with the underwater domain awareness. We have missed the date, but let's not miss it further. We should start now and also, Arnab, you mentioned in the Indian Ocean region. The surface domain awareness is also transnational. But at least you can again see, you can demarcate the surface of the ocean, but you cannot demarcate the underwater. The underwater dimension of the ocean has no boundaries and you cannot enforce it. Therefore, Arnab, the question of cooperation. Underwater domain awareness will not succeed unless we cooperate regionally and globally. And that is where I, I, I can fully appreciate your approach. Uh, because the biodiversity of the ocean would not respect boundaries. The chemical composition of the ocean will not respect boundaries. The physical nature of the uh, uh, currents will not respect boundaries. If one messes up, the others will also face the consequences. Right? 
So therefore, in fact, it's a complex issue. I think we need to start at the bottom and then go forward uh, up the ladder. In fact, I would suggest, uh, no, let's start with education. We need to create understanding of the importance of ocean. And this should start, in my view, in schools. Let the school children understand the importance of ocean. Then we go to the college. They must start understanding how to respond to these complex phenomena within the ocean. Then we go to the centers of higher education for technology development. The kind of technology, the underwater domain awareness would require we do not still have. They are all, in fact, scratching at the boundaries of, because we, I know, you know, some people have done a lot of work on, uh, say, marine biotechnology. But this is in isolated fields of their narrow interest. Nobody is dealing with underwater holistically. What is happening on the surface? What is happening at different depths? What is happening in terms of, as I said, chemicals, chemistry, physics, and, and biology of these waters. It's going to be a test of human intelligence. Believe me, in fact, we very loosely use the term knowledge-driven societies. But when you get into the ocean, you will see that this knowledge is absolutely inadequate in dealing with underwater awareness. Then, of course, as I said, it will need cooperation with other countries, which we need to create mechanisms and instruments of that cooperation, sharing of information, sharing of data, sharing of technology, all that stuff. And then it will also require what is called regulation. How do we regulate this? Because I know my mistake will hurt others also. And the other's mistake will hurt me also. Then how do we, how do, we do it? You know, there are international treaties on how to deal with the ocean, but those international treaties are old. They are, they, they need now specialized attention to the ocean awareness segments, right? Uh, we all know about UNCLOS. We know about how uh, the, uh, the uh, International Maritime Organization controls certain things. Uh, we are, I don't know the latest status of those, those treaties. We are treating, we are negotiating treaties for seabed mining and uh, the biodiversity beyond national boundaries. Now, we know, of course, uh, you know, the regulation on, on uh, 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 special biological zones, their protection. But still, we are still in kindergarten of understanding the underwater domain of awareness. So I think my time is over. Uh, I would say, let's all, let's all understand ocean's health is absolutely critical to maintaining the eco ecological balance on the entire planet. We can't forget it 70% of the Earth's surface. And if you look at the depth, which is operational depth on Earth, the operational depth is very little, but in the ocean, the ocean, operational depth is everything is there. You can go right up to the bottom. We can't go, but there are organisms which go right up to the up to the bottom, right? And we drill the uh, bottom, uh, the sur bottom surface for energy and other resources. And now we talk about seabed mining. Now this is massive. Uh, uh, Arna, please keep telling everyone. Don't get in the ocean blindfolded, for God's sake. This will pay us enormously if we deal with it wisely. But it can hurt us immensely if we deal with it without adequate respect for the ocean's health. I think with these words, I will stop. I can talk many hours on this subject uh, because I've spent many years in this. Uh, but I know today I have 20 minutes and I think I've taken my 20 minutes. So let me thank everyone. You have uh, wonderful experts on the panel today. But I thought I will just make very broad 
uh, arguments in favor of underwater domain awareness. And I hope I made it. Sometimes I look scary, but I think the situation is, if we don't deal with it wisely, it would become very scary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Muktal, for sharing your valuable uh, recommendations and uh, giving a comprehensive explanation to all of us. Uh, your thoughts have truly enlightened us, sir. And I think my biggest takeaway from your uh, keynote speak, uh, like speeches, that ocean's health is very critical to balance the ecological system. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, next, I'd like to call uh, Dr. Arnab Das to explain to us the significance of UDA framework in the Indo-Pacific space. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to speak about uh, Dr. Das. So Dr. Das is an ex-naval officer with two decades of active services. And uh, he's a PhD holder from Indian Institute of Technology, IT Delhi, with, speciali with specialization in underwater acoustics. Uh, he has worked on several projects and has a plethora of publications in his credit. Uh, Dr. Das is the author of the book titled Marine Eco Concern and its impact on the Indian Maritime Strategy, which was supported by the Indian Maritime Foundation and, and was published uh, in February 2017. So uh, I'd like to call you, sir to take over the stage and lead the webinar forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, first of all, I must thank all the esteemed uh, panelists and also very distinguished uh, audience today, uh, particularly Ambassador Mudgal, sir, uh, uh, Mr. Heman Jani, uh, uh, who's uh, heading the Capacity Building Commission, extremely important uh, uh, entity in the government of India. Uh, I have my uh, very old friend, uh, Tamori Akamatsu from Tokyo. Uh, we have Professor uh, Ratnayake, Vasanta Ratnayake from Sri Lanka. And uh, I have a, a young friend from Brest, France, Juliet, uh, who is, uh, because uh, we have carefully chosen the panel members. Uh, France has a significant interest in the Indian Ocean. And I think they have significant uh, uh, ease it uh, in the Indian Ocean. So their perspective is equally important. Sri Lanka is a very important uh, part of the Indian Ocean. Uh, uh, and uh, definitely Japan is on a different level of technology and the focus on uh, maritime and the ocean affairs. And Ambassador Mudgal, sir, has been in Mauritius and uh, he has been part of many uh, initiatives. And uh, most importantly, I think, he has been part of the Sagar vision right from the inception. So with that perspective, uh, I would like to quickly mention about uh, the underwater domain awareness that we are progressing. Uh, it is basically to look at sustainable blue oceans in the new global order. I mean, today when you see this, uh, it is a decade of the ocean sciences for sustainable development. I mean, what do we make of it is very important. and how do we want to realize uh, these kind of lofty words? Uh, so digital ocean, definitely, I mean, uh, governance, I think, will become the, the key to any of such initiatives. And uh, how do we uh, bring more technology into it and more transparency? And that's what is the underwater domain awareness all about. So uh, just to give you a quick sense of the new global order that I'm trying to talk about, I mean, today, the larger maritime interactions are happening in, happening in the tropical waters. And more specifically, it is the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. I mean, there is a, but it's very important for us to realize that these are very unique uh, regions, unique in terms of political, economic, military, and physical. So it is important when we look at uh, uh, any new initiative, we must first understand what are we getting into. Now, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, or strategic space is being repeatedly talked about by the global community in every big forum. This is a discussion. More and more players are getting into it. Uh, France, uh, I mean, Indo-Pacific uh, was probably initiated. I mean, the term itself came, uh, we lost uh, uh, Mr. Sinjo Abe uh, recently uh, in a very tragic incident. But it is his uh, terminology in the Indian Parliament. I mean, it has the significant strategic uh, significance. And then the American establishment took it forward. But now we see 
many uh, big uh, players or uh, <laughs> extra regional powers uh, announcing their participation in the uh, specific uh, strategic uh, construct. Now, the definition itself of the Indo-Pacific strategic space is the uh, tropical waters of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So the tropical waters need to be understood. I mean, I'll not go into the details of it. The very uh, 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 simple thing is to understand that anything we want to look below the water, the underwater survey or the acoustic survey, the tropical waters have very, very challenging uh, impact. I mean, the sonar performance goes down significantly. So the import of technology, which has become the norm, does not help. I mean, of course, the extra regional powers would be too happy to sell it to us. But because of certain political instability and certain political challenges, the governance mechanism is a big uh, uh, problem. So, I mean, these are all interrelated things and we need to look at it in uh, perspective. Now, when we talk about the Indian Ocean, firstly, the position of India in the Indian Ocean is extremely unique. And I think there is no better uh, country than India to take the lead in this. And rightly so, the Honorable Prime Minister has uh, announced the Sagar vision, security and growth for all in the region. It recognizes the security concerns that we have and also the economic uh, opportunities that we have. How do we take it forward is the question that, I mean, how do we realize the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister? Now, uh, there has been a lot of, and more recently, the AUKUS has been a major uh, announcement and the AUKUS, although the players are a little outside, I mean, uh, Britain, US, Australia, but the region where this submarine will be deployed or this collaboration is going to operate is definitely the Indo-Pacific region. So now this is a more of a hardware uh, kind of a uh, collaboration, but if it has to be deployed in the Indo-Pacific, there's a lot more underwater domain awareness that needs to be generated. And the focus has to be the UD in the tropical waters. <clears throat> but one must understand the UDA in its proper context. I mean, the Cold War period was the one where the underwater technology development or the UDA actually took shape. I mean, right from the socius and more recently the underwater Great Wall project by the Chinese. Now, if you look at it, the larger technology development happened uh, during the Cold War and the socius and various other uh, initiatives were supporting that. But that uh, is completely different from what is required in the tropical waters. The underwater Great Wall project is a very big initiative by the Chinese. And I think it tries to generate the kind of inputs that are required for UDA in the tropical waters. But the complexity of underwater domain awareness, I think, is exemplified by the accident that happened recently where USA's Connecticut got grounded in the South China Sea. I mean, with the might of the Americans, the kind of technology that they have, the kind of know-how that they have, still the tropical waters were too much for them to really kind of ensure safety of their very high value assets. Now, global effort on UDA, if we look at it, particularly in the tropical waters. It was the turn of the, I mean, the beginning of the century where the Americans initiated what is called the Asia X. It was a massive exercise in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, basically to develop models and the validation. And post that, it became a regular feature to deploy underwater drones and continuously update their information. Now, that was followed by, so the Chinese, when we talk about Asia X, it's very interesting to see. And the Americans were very clear that they want data, they want to validate their models in the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean, and particularly the Pacific Ocean, because they have to operate in the South China Sea and the East China Sea to counter the rise of China. But what is important is just after Asia X, they continued to deploy drones 
and uh, acoustic arrays in the Indian Ocean, uh, sorry, in the Pacific Ocean, I mean, basically South China Sea, to continuously update their models. The Chinese participated in Ixia X because it was made to look like an academic exercise. The, the academia from China also participated, but they were clear that, I mean, I was in Shanghai and I spoke to people. They said that they were clear that they cannot do something like this on their own, so they wanted to learn. And the follow-up of that was the uh, announcement of the Underwater Great Wall project in 2015. And if we understand this, this is at least 20, 25 years of work. So Asia X was very much part of a larger plan. And this was a major acoustic capacity building effort by the Chinese. Even the MS370 uh, search was a very classic case. I'll not go into the details, but just to give you a sense of the the challenges of underwater domain awareness, the, uh, the team took almost a year to do the underwater charts for deployment, I mean, of the right resolution, the underwater charts that were required for deploying AUVs, it took them almost a year uh, because that kind of underwater domain awareness was not available. So that are the challenge we are, that we are talking about. So if we have to talk about the tropical waters, field experimental R&D is extremely inescapable. And that is something that is very rare in this part of the world. Now, I'll not go into the details of the... So the Underwater Great Wall project is a very interesting th uh, project. And I've talked about the details. It was a multi-agency collaboration, both within China and also they took help from wherever possible. I mean, the Americans were just one part of it, but even other researchers that I'm aware of, uh, I mean, the Chinese were open to take help from anywhere. And it was a major and a serious capacity building effort that they uh, had. To, and you can see, I mean, uh, I, I mean, after what happened, I mean, after they announced the Underwater Great Wall project and during the Trump presidency, you could see how belligerent uh, the Chinese were. I mean, they had done their preparation and they uh, kind of, you know, made sure. Now, there's one very interesting dimension of underwater domain awareness. Uh, I mean, in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1988, when we deployed a nuclear submarine in our waters, uh, the submarine uh, took position and the entire sonar screen got blanked out. This was because of the snapping shrimps. Snapping shrimps are a very small creature that generates sound of the order of 200 dB reference one micropascal, whereas the biggest whale, uh, blue whale generates 196 dB reference. So these are different dimensions of underwater domain awareness that we need to take note of. And as we are getting into the next era or the new global order, we have to take note of the different dimensions of the UDA that we are talking about. <clears throat> so we've talked about this. Now, typically, after the 9-11 in the US and also in the Indian Ocean after the 26-11, maritime domain awareness became a buzzword and everybody was using it. But the underwater component of it somehow did not get the attention that it deserves. And my worry is that because it was more of an event-driven and uh, more of a security-driven uh, initiative, the participation by the other stakeholders was quite limited. And that ensured, because underwater uh, domain awareness requires a very different type of technology also. It cannot be the generic MDA which can take care of both. Unless we focus on the underwater technology and particularly the uniqueness of, of the uh, tropical waters, we will really not be able to uh, make uh, a lot of headway. Now, the stakeholders are well known. Just quickly to give you a sense of what it is, I mean, we are talking about huge submarine proliferation in the Indian Ocean region. Even smaller countries are now looking at deploying submarines. These technologies are not the very mature technology that we used to earlier source from Europe and you know the West, which have been operating submarines for a very long time. Even China has been now offering submarines to countries in this region. I think there is still a lot of maturing still required. So there are even, and they, uh, they, we also have countries deploying nuclear submarine. So safety also becomes an issue. Uh, so when we talk about underwater domain awareness, there are multiple dimensions that get involved into it. 
then we have the issue of internal security i mean the political instability the active non state actors they add a very different dimension to a lot of disruptive technologies and the asymmetry that these uh, uh, non state actors can uh, bring is a huge challenge and a, a very worrying the second is the blue economy i mean uh, we talk about energy security we talk about uh, food security unless i mean uh, we really focus uh, on capacity building i think we will really miss the bus i mean there is lot more to be done i mean there are very big announcements there are very big projects or i would say mega projects deep ocean mission is one uh, even you know, fisheries is uh, something uh, we need to be very very serious about but in the fisheries uh, the uh, it is largely in the unorganized sector use of technology is very very limited so uh, uh, the regulation is uh, i think uh, there's a lot more to be done uh, even environment and disaster management is a very serious uh, i mean there are so many dimensions of i mean uh, ambassador mudgal talked about plastic but i think many uh, people don't realize the biggest culprit of uh, ocean plastic is the fishing nets and there is a nexus to create a narrative about single use plastic and various other things i mean there are figures which say about 60% is uh, fishing nets uh, but uh, the lobby doesn't allow that to come out and of course uh, underwater noise is not getting the attention although now i international maritime organization has started speaking about it but still there is so much more to be done uh, uh, and and uh, since there is no lobby to lobby for the uh, marine poor marine species i think this is taken i mean 1982 uh, was the first time in the unclos hazards of noise have been recognized but it is still not come into uh, uh, a proper regulation to uh, control it i mean disaster management needs no i mean there is increasing evidence of uh, uh, natural disasters uh, originating from the sea but i i think still there is a lot more work to be done in terms of uh, uh, early warning of uh, uh, the disasters originating from the sea and of course science and technology how do we get more and more i mean in the indian ocean our understanding of the ecosystem itself requires a lot of a uh, lot more work uh, and just if you talk about india about 20 lakh square kilometers are we going to put sensors all across how do we leverage uh, smart technology how do we bring in Uh, the state of the art technology is something we really need to focus i mean ai and robotics particularly i mean that's why i call it uh, the digital ocean is what we need to focus on and really kind of and india has uh, a huge population i mean there's a huge demographic advantage how do we channelize that into such an important area is something we need to focus on Uh, this is the framework that we talk about if you look at the four faces of the cube they represent the four stakeholders that we just discussed but there is very little synergy very little pooling of resources still uh, i mean after the 2611 lot of money was given for security but of course you don't expect uh, the security budget to pay for capacity building i mean which is so much more lacking there has to be a whole of nation approach i mean i don't think the security budget or more specifically the navy's budget can sustain such a major requirement technology development cannot be done uh, uh, by uh, the defense or the security budget so how do we get in everybody together is something so acoustic capacity building uh, i mean just to give you a sense the tropical water the underwater survey degrades i mean the technology that we import from the west uh when we check it there and when we deploy it here the degradation is of the order of 60 to 70% so can one stakeholder pay for the capacity building that is required so it has to be a whole of nation approach all the stakeholders have to kind of uh, focus on field uh, experimental r&d and build the uh, national capacity to a level and i think we can leverage this kind of technology development for uh the entire region i mean we can actually really help our neighbors and there will come the leadership role i mean if we can be a technology leader we can actually establish i mean even the regional regulatory framework will be better driven if we have a regional approach and i mean that's what is probably the essence of the sagar vision by the honorable prime minister and if you look at the vertical construct there is so much to be done in, in terms of uh, understanding ending our orders a lot of sensing a lot of analysis is required and then only we should be looking at 
the uh, policy framework. Typically, we have a top-down approach. We import even the policy from somewhere which doesn't work in our waters and we get into difficulty. So there's a lot of work uh, to be done. It has to be a bottom-up approach, but you know it will require a long-term plan and a very structured approach. Uh, even, I mean, how to deploy the demography, I mean, young India uh, can also be answered by this framework. Even the policy prioritizing can be done using this thing. So there are a whole lot of aspects that can be. So the entire policy and technology intervention along with capacity building can be very uh, uh, properly managed using this UDA framework that we are talking about. And the UDA framework is not just about the marine system. It is also addresses all kinds of issues in the freshwater system, whether it is water resource management, water quality management, <coughs> and a whole lot of other aspects. And we have uh, dissected this into smaller components like underwater radiated noise. <coughs> There's a very important requirement for security because stealth is an important area but also equally important as far as uh, ecology is concerned or the conservation is concerned. So acoustic habitat degradation becomes important. All the strandings of marine mammals that we are talking about. And of course, ship design and ship <coughs> building has to adapt and be abreast with what's happening. I mean, underwater noise is a very, very important issue. How do we address the various aspects again can be answered by the UDA framework that we're talking about. <clears throat> there are a lot of projects that are required to be done, a lot of data uh, or I mean the whole underwater domain awareness needs uh, a lot of work. I'll not go into the details, but uh, I mean we have uh, uh, kind of uh, put them in a lot of details and how what are the specific areas of, of focus that require attention. <clears throat> this is just one example where technology can really make it cost effective, viable in many ways. I mean, this is a map that we have generated based on the AIS data. AIS gives you the complete details of shipping. Using the AIS data online, we have <clears throat> built algorithms which can actually give you the underwater noise. This can be used for conservation. You can find out where, why the strandings that are happening are increasingly happening in our West Coast. It can be easily mapped out and you know what ex action can be taken. There can be policy intervention on such uh, real-time uh, data uh, inputs that are available. Even Navy can use it for various underwater deployments. Whole lot of other, I mean, uh, Stakeholders can use this uh, for various applications right at the policy intervention and also technology intervention. And these are, uh, uh, I mean, you can uh, do the entire digital ocean uh, mapping using such tools. I mean, we have developed various tools even for shrimp farming, even for uh, seaweed farming and various such applications. You can see this. I mean, the habitat mapping and then the, the sound mapping of shrimps can easily be done. And we are so blessed. I mean, being in the tropical water, the biodiversity is so high. How do we utilize such a uh, uh, important resource that is available to you uh, to us and uh, uh, contribute to the blue economic development? Is something really requires focus. But we are still getting beaten. I mean, the coastal communities are really not able to leverage. The tropical conditions that we have and financial institutions are not ready to help them because there is so much uncertainty in their practices so the digital ocean can bring a huge amount of transparency a lot of certainty and that's that can actually uh, connect end to end i mean the financial mechanism and the user can easily kind of uh, collaborate very well with so much more certainty uh, we continue to uh, create awareness, reach out. Uh, UDA Summer School is a program we do where we have, it's a peer learning format. We have even officers uh, from the Navy, Coast Guard and shipyards attending this. Even DRDO scientists have attended this and along with young students. So there's an exposure. There's a lot of learning. Everybody does a project. So a lot of, I mean, and you can see the resource persons are the, uh, the topmost people. I mean, from diplomacy, bureaucracy, academy, a whole lot of I mean, uh, from the stakeholders, you can see that uh, former Naval Chief, uh, Director of uh, National Institute of Oceanography, a whole lot of senior, I mean, uh, Honorable Chief Minister of Goa. Uh, uh, then we focus on uh, field work. Uh, this is an experiment we did, five day workshop we did in Kharakwasla, proper uh, sonars were uh, deployed. You can see the pictures. Uh, this was also part of a PhD work that was done and there's a lot of data that got collected and that can be easily used 
for policy intervention as well. I mean, you can see these pictures, a lot of field work was done. So, I mean, I would uh, uh, recommend an outreach engaged sustained program where we, in the outreach, we uh, sensitize uh, the stakeholders, the policy makers, and even young students on what are the opportunities and how they can go about it. In engage, we make a proper structured engagement plan, whether it is MOUs with the stakeholders, fellowships for the youngsters, and a whole lot of other mechanisms for engaging and then sustaining would be how to make a closed loop or a circular kind of a model where one feeds the other. I mean, if somebody is trained, he to get engaged, unity, how to carry our opportunities can be built into it. I mean, a complete uh, what kind of policy framework or what kind of policy interventions, technology interventions can be done. And I think at the end, I would recommend uh, setting up of a center of excellence, which is uh, which has got five sub centers, multidisciplinary research, uh, incubation to encourage startups or innovation, skilling and leadership. Academic, uh, we have uh, developed modules which are approved by uh, AICT and various uh, established uh, regulators and also policy. This is the user academy of uh, <coughs> industry. There are already schemes uh, announced by the government of India. The government of India has been very, very proactive. It is just that many of these schemes need to get connected. So uh, Skill India, Make in India, Startup India, Digital India, all can be, there is already uh, allocations. It just needs to be connected and what are the core specialization that is required and how it addresses what are the stakeholders are very well uh, kind of presented in this. So thank you. I think I have taken a little extra time. And uh, so I hand over back to Nishta. Thank you very much, Arnab, sir, for sharing with us the vision of underwater domain awareness framework and how it can be executed in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, next, I would like to invite a very special guest to speak to us and share his valuable insights. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us uh, Mr. Himam Jani. Uh, Shri Jani is the Secretary Capacity Building Commission at the Government of India. Uh, Sir has served as a member of the Atal Innovation Mission's High Level Committee for over seven years. Uh, prior to that, Mr. Jani has also served as the Officer on Special Duty for Prime Minister's Office for the period between June 2014 till December 2016. Uh, Mr. Jani has also served as a Senior Private Sector Specialist at the World Bank. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, kindly take the stage and we would like to hear from you regarding today's subject. Hope I hope you can hear me now. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. Very much my and uh, bringing me on, on this extremely esteemed panel. Uh, please, if you stop hearing my voice, just tinker me in between. But uh, I am neither an expert nor uh, of uh, security domain or the maritime domain. Uh, uh, so I will speak from the lens of capacity building purely uh, on which I am working at the government of India right now. But as you, uh, as, as uh, uh, the speakers before also mentioned, India has a very important position in the maritime domain. We have 7,500 kilometers of uh, coastline. And we are the only nation who has a ocean named after it, Indian Ocean. And that is why the Sagar vision of Honorable Prime Minister, because it doesn't affect only us, but the entire region, and particularly the South Asian and Southeast Asian region, it becomes very important as well. Uh, you all know that India has ambitions. We are we have already reached Mars. We are going to Moon, and we have we have also uh, 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 put a vision of scaling the ocean through the deep ocean mission. And at that time, underwater awareness becomes very important. So, uh, from the capacity building lens, I, one important thing I would like to note in the Sagar vision is Sagar vision is a bottom up approach. And when bottom up approach is important, the capacity building of various institutions is involved becomes very important. And if we talk about capacity building, we should look at three areas. One is the domain knowledge, second is the functional areas, and third the behavioral areas. 
now uh, ambassador mudda uh, very very near the maritime and underwater uh, uh, areas is 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 extremely important just just the Someone's not only the people, but also the institutions. The people, 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 people. Uh, all the countries around the Indian Ocean not only can collaborate, but also can, you know, start putting significant effort. For example, in domain knowledge areas like underwater biotechnology, even underwater AI and robotics, will will become very important. What uh, Arnab was showing in his presentation. Uh, 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 emerging technology is soon going to play a very vital role in this area but none of the universities in india or even if you look at uh, we have uh, sri lanka on the panel today and any other countries in this part of the world they offer any courses around this so if we can start thinking about this in our academic institutions and at, even in other technical institutions that becomes very important at the same time the traditional areas like signal processing modeling and simulation uh, simple data analytics and data science uh, through which we operate right now they also become important and we should we should think of building awareness at the at the same time collaborations uh, across the countries to uh, help in this domain awareness areas but i would also like to put stress on the functional areas Uh, see, we are we are working in the civilian domain here. We are working on the civil service capacity building, and the biggest areas of capacity building are not the domain knowledge. They are the behavioral competencies and functional competencies. And when you have such a multi-stakeholder, multi-nation framework in place, even small issues like behavioral competencies, like capability, capacity to negotiate in good faith. capacity to appreciate the uh, other party on the table those become extremely important and uh, we don't train our people we don't put enough effort in this area so i think we should also not forget when we talk about other important issues on technology and conservation how do we deal with creating this behavioral competencies amongst the agencies and institutions second area is very uh, important uh, uh, on the functional competencies simple issues like law of sea international law uh, understanding of coastal regulation environment laws in india if you see from state to state environment framework varies and their uh, uh, implication on various projects also vary But another area big area which often over gets overlooked is the disaster management India is very strong in disaster management. We have dealt with various disasters in very capable manner. But awareness of disaster management for underwater domain will be totally different. Will be totally uh, different. So we shouldn't forget about building capacity in this area as well. And of course, coastal management, coastal engineering techniques, etc. Uh, uh, we have already started offering courses, and we have already started offering uh, uh, thinking about this from the capacity building lens. But those remain as well important. Uh, uh, just to sum up, I don't want to take much time because I am already on the road, and I don't know when will I lose the connectivity. But to sum up, I think uh, for such an important issue, the capacity building lens has to shift from individual to organizational domain. so how do we focus more on organizational capacity building and institutional capacity building that will define the success of such a large agenda of course individual capacity building remains important but it gets addressed in one way or the other various agencies talk about it and they also make some effort but organizational capacity building and institution building remains very 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 important so i hope uh, uh, i will hear a lot from the fellow fellow panelist on this and also learn a lot from them on the specific areas and domains but i hope these areas also get covered uh, enough in your this and the future talks and impo enough importance is given on that again in as to mention i am here to learn to today because i am need there um, 
मेरिट है नेक्स्ट बट fascinating to learn from you you and uh, uh, so for what i have heard i have I have learned a lot so all the best to you to find your effort but please continue and uh, uh uh thank you very much for all of you to join in thank you thank you very much himang sir for taking out a uh, precious time from your busy schedule and sharing your thoughts on the area of your expertise with us thank you very much I just want to inform the audience. Uh, Emang Jani sir is actually touring in the northeast, and uh, he has a very poor connectivity. But uh, we will uh, connect back with him uh, uh, at some convenient time, and uh, we will uh, probably re-record uh, his bite again. And because we also keep the recording in our website. uh so that uh, later on also people can uh, actually access that uh, very valuable points made by sir and uh, we would definitely uh, like to connect with him and contribute in whatever way possible and uh, we will uh, also be working on the report later so uh, thank you so much sir uh, nishtha back to you thank you thank you sir so yes all our recordings are available on the website as well as uh, on uh, the youtube channel of maritime research center so after like this is done and you would want to go back to the video you would want to go back to the webinar you can always go back to the webinar uh, through our social media accounts and through our website uh, now i would like to clear the stage for professor vasantha ratnayake uh, professor ratnayake is the board chairman and vice chancellor of uh, ocean university sri lanka his words uh, would become all the more important because sri lanka and india both share their existence in the indian ocean region uh he has uh, he was the former head of the department of tourism management and dean of the faculty of management studies at uh, sabaragumuva university of sri lanka before joining the university system he was the deputy director protected area development and management and the department of wildlife Con conservation besides his uh, academic uh, stint uh, professor vasantha ratnayake contributes to the national development as a consultant uh i'd like to call him and uh, i'd request him to share his uh, views and guide us in this webinar ahead okay thank, thank you, you uh, i want to share my presentation with you right can i share that document with you sure sure sir please share right so you can hear me right yes sir okay so we are going to talk about uh, marine spatial planning and the regional outlook so as uh, ms nishta mentioned so i am <laughs> basically i am uh, i am an ecologist or somebody can say i am an environmentalist or environmental economist like that so so that means i serve in different field so now i am the vice chancellor of ocean university of sri lanka right so uh, this is a very simple presentation so i think you people will uh, you can question you can uh, uh, you can ask questions if something is wrong or something is to be corrected like that please right so this is uh, marine uh, special planning so that uh, this is a definition so that uh, msp we can say that 
So most important parts are in this definition. So this is an integrated approach. Human use of marine space and interaction among users. So marine spatial planning is a practical way to create and establish a more rational and integrated approach to human use of marine space and interaction among these users. So this is for conservation. So uh, as an environmentalist, I can say marine spatial planning for conservation. So utilization is there, protection is there, management is there, and enforcement is also there. So this provides a way to balance demand for development with the need to protect marine ecosystem. So we want to protect our marine ecosystem and to achieve social, economic, and ecological objectives in an open, transparent, and planned way. So that means, so Dr. Arnab also talked about blue economy. He talked about pollution, research and innovation, so marine security. So all are in this marine spatial planning concept. So these are the characteristics of MSP, Marine Spatial Plan. Integrated and multi-objective across sectors and agencies, and even level of government, and including social and economic objectives, as well as ecological ones. So continuing and adaptive. So this is a continuous process, and we have to consider we have to consider the adaptive management. So we will talk about that. That is strategic and anticipatory. So we are focused on the long term. So that means uh, this is not a medium term, this is for long term. Long term uh, activities or the uh, expectations. So participatory. So as all the stakeholders should participate in the MSP process, place-based or area-based. So a lot of speakers talk about that, and ecosystem-based. Or we can say that is landscape-based, base. right. So now, uh, so uh, in our landscape, uh, in our marine spatial planning, so we have to consider following as aspects. So animals, marine animals, habitats, populations, oil and gas deposits, marine and mineral deposits, sustained winds and waves, marine resources actually. So in our in our spatial planning, we have to consider all these aspects. All are very important. And they are found in various places and at various times. So think about winds and waves. So why spatial planning is important or required? Successful marine management needs planners and management managers that understand how to work with the spatial and temporal diversity of the sea. So understanding these spatial and temporal distribution and mapping them is an important part of MSP. So we can ma map the resources. Map, uh, managing human activities to enhance compatible users and reduce conflicts among users. So this is important for reducing conflicts between human activities and nature. So uh, next one is examine how this distribution might change due to climate change and other long-term pressures, overfishing, overdevelopment on marine system. So these are the benefits of MSP. 
you know you know these things economic benefits environmental benefits social benefits and administrative benefits so that's why we need msp so i am not going to explain everything so we have benefits so we should go for msp marine spatial planning so regional outlook so i i think so awareness is very very important that is a requirement so this marine spatial planning is a relatively new term then communication about how msp improves quality and efficiency of decision making so we we have to we are the, the we have to conduct awareness program to communicate why msp is important so this is important for decision making then overcoming barriers to msp so we know the that uh, concept but we have to overcome some of barriers otherwise we can achieve msp so legal and institutional authorities the existing legal and institutional uh, authorities so they they promote a sector based approaches sometimes these authority exist in opposition to idea and participate uh, practicable abilities of, of integration so these are these are found in our society then timing so it will take some time then unintended negative impact care must be taken to avoid unintended negative impacts of integrating new strategies so we have to think about climate impacts so we have to minimize the climate impacts so another important thing is increase initial investment so investment is there in this process then cultural resistance we have to work with sometimes we have to work with uh, different different groups the resistance is there then limited financing so these are some of overcoming barriers to msp in lot of developing countries then attending to the policy issues we have to attend to the policy issues so we should have ocean policies we should have an all ocean policy for the individual countries and region so we are, then we can balance the use and conservation of ocean areas so we should have a binding framework or the vision so we have defined or demarcated our exclusive economic zones so so we different policies and we know that uh, sometimes that overlapping conflicts lot of things are going on international and cross boundary marine zones we have signed some of conventions but there are some problems or issues found in implementing these conventions so we should have a mechanism for cross boundary cooperation so that's why we we need the ocean policy for the region so this is our policy so we have individual policies but we have to think about the regional policy what is our regional ocean policy so i have uh, 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 read some of uh, research articles so we have to take some actions for overcoming implementation challenges data data issues we have data issues we can use modern technology for uh, collecting data so but lot of countries in this region 
so especially include in our country. So we don't have enough funds for research with, with this financial crisis. So we don't have a proper data collection system and storage system and sharing mechanism that is there. Then all opinion and conflict in sectoral interest. So everybody is trying to work within their territory. So conflict, a lot of conflicts. So lack of human resource, resources and capacity. So we need capacity building programs. Issues with spatial planning coordination. Coordination is also very difficult. I think all the countries are facing this issue. So lack of legality of indigenous community and its area management. So we have to deal with indigenous community. So lack of infrastructure and infrastructure and information system to disseminate MSC planning among public users. So these are uh, so we have to we have to tackle these things. So these are some of the challenges. Then we have to give our special concern for the following ecosystem approach. So all the state, all the uh, speakers talk about ecosystem approach and marine spatial planning, policy and legislation, high level goals for marine spatial planning. So obligations are derived from global, regional, national and local commitments and build on existing policies or amend the existing policies, as I mentioned earlier. So we should give our special concern for this, this one, policy and legislation. So need for stakeholder driven plan. So there is a strongly felt need or commitment by the institutions and communities that have the actual decision making authority. So that means stakeholders should participate in the MSP process. And need for strong, supportive legal framework. So we have talked about. Then ocean zone, that is also very important. So we have to identify the ecologically important area and environmentally vulnerable areas. So these things are very important ocean planning, ocean zoning. Then sustainable financing mechanism. So that means we have all the government should allocate a particular amount or we that means that allocate some money to monitor ocean and coastal uses. So this is for monitoring purposes. And adaptive management is also very, very important. based on the available data so that we have plan we, we have a plan but we have to understand the situation and we should amend or amend the our plan so that is very important 
adaptive management. That part is very important in resource management. So capacity development is very, very important. So we can collect data, but capacity building is very important. So how to analyze data, how to plan, how to use this data for the data and information for planning, uh, planning purposes, the implementation and evaluation. This is very important. Then traditional management approaches. So community-based approaches to coastal and marine resource management. So these are the so very, very important aspects we have to consider. So, with, so far we have signed, as uh, uh, Dr. Arnab mentioned, with, so that Sri Lanka and India, we have signed some agreements. So agreement between Sri Lanka and India on maritime boundary between two countries in the Gulf of Mena like that. So we have signed some of convention, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, then the aquaculture centers in Asia and the Pacific, transboundary movements of hazardous waste and their disposal. So you can see here, I have mentioned 18 conventions or agreements. So biological diversity is there. Early notification of a nuclear accident. Even CITES. Then uh, migratory species of wild animals, the convention of migratory species of wild animals. So here that wild animals means uh, uh, we can consider turtles. So sake program, then the prevention of pollution from ships. There are many. Indian Ocean, Ocean Southeast Asia Memorandum of Understanding for Turtle Conservation, Ramsar Convention, a lot of conventions we have signed. But we can see, so there, we can see the failures in implementation so so the, and uh, some of countries like our country we should have some of sign some of international conventions for uh, for maintaining the uh, our marine environment so uh, very recently pearl express case so diamond ship uh, that, that case so we should. So that, that means that is for the. So we have to maintain the marine environment as a healthy environment. So we should have sign agreement. So I think that we have to consider the legal framework, and we have signed some some of conventions or agreements, and our own. Uh, uh, laws based on that marine spatial planning should be done. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ratnaiki, for sharing your thoughts on uh, marine spatial planning and for apprising our audience about the signed international and regional conventions between uh, Sri Lanka and other nations. Uh, now we have with us uh, Miss Juliet Rimets. Uh, I'd like to inform you about her. Uh, Miss Juliet is a project coordinator at Campus Mondial de la Mer in France. She's also an organizer of the Sea Tech Week. Today she has joined us for this webinar and would like to, and she would discuss with us her thoughts on global initiatives and role on uh, innovation in this domain. Uh, welcome, Miss Juliet. The stage is all yours to share your valuable input with us. Hello. Thank you for your invitation. So I would like to, to thank the organizer for, for this opportunity to, to present the Campus Mondial de la Mer and uh, 
some of its uh, actions, uh, and especially CTEC Week. So, um, just okay. Okay, so I'm currently in Brest, in France. You can can see on the map, so it's uh, very uh, close to India. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Brest is, is a city uh, at the tip of, uh, of the area named Brittany, and uh, we are on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean and the English Channel. So, you, you can see uh, on this uh, slide the uh, picture of, uh, of the coast and uh, also of uh, the city of Brest. So I'm Juliette, I'm a project coordinator at Technopole brest iroise and uh, in the team Campus Mondial de la Mer. Uh, so just a few words about uh, uh, Technopole brest iroise uh, This is a, a, a science park and uh, the objectives are to support the business creation and development, to reinforce and promote the competencies and also to encourage networking and uh, develop partnerships. So um, before uh, presenting Campus Mondial de la Mer, uh, I would like to, to provide you some geographical and historical aspects that led to the creation of, uh, of this campus. Um, so uh, as you see on, on the map, so the Britannic coast represents one third of the total coastline of the mainland France. So we are very uh, faced to the sea. Um, second point is that the, the Technopole Science Park uh, uh, creation was a tool to, to face the economic crisis in the 19th in Brest, and especially uh, uh, the naval shipyard crisis and also the, the defense restructuring. And uh, it led to, uh, to work uh, to a diversification of the activities uh, in Brest and uh, based mainly on innovation and interdisciplinarity. Um, and the third point is that due to the location of uh, Brest at the tip of Brittany, uh, we have a, a unique uh, island character and so uh, it um, uh, implies a long tradition of collaboration between the local players in the field of marine science and technology and uh, maritime economy. So based on this context, we, we created the, the Campus Mondial de la Mer. Okay, so the, the official launch was in uh, 2016 and uh, uh, we also uh, uh, wrote uh, the first action plan. So the Campus Mondial de la Mer is a, a community and uh, our action activities uh, are mainly supported by uh, the Brest City Council and also the, the Brittany region. Oh, I just, I would like just before uh, 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 going on, I would like to, to share a video, a short video uh, that presents the uh, Campus Mondial de la Mer. So I will try to. Uh, up, uh, to do. Mm -hmm. Just I'll stop the sharing and sharing again. OK. Welcome to Campus Mondial de la Mer, the first French maritime innovation community open to the world. From the establishment of the French Navy's Académie de Marine in Brest over 200 years ago, to the launch of Campus Mondial de la Mer in 2016, Brest and Brittany have always been a focus for maritime activity in France and beyond. Today, Brittany is the main center in Europe for marine scientific research and the top location in France for research jobs. Finestre boasts 1,400 kilometers or over 850 miles of coastline and offers the most maritime employment of any French region. Campus Mondial de la Mer brings together a network of stakeholders, all of them active in marine and maritime science and technology. They come from academic and research institutions, government bodies and businesses. Our strengths come from active communities in Brest, Roscoff, Morlaix, Quimper, Concarneau and the surrounding areas. This part of Brittany already has a great international reputation for fishing and boat building and repairs. But Campus Mondial de la Mer also excels in many other areas. 
The Roscoff Marine Station has created an innovative ecosystem around biotechnology. It provides ideal conditions for innovative companies such as CB Life, who has developed a range of candidate medicines for blocking regulated cell death. Polymeris, based in Brest, discovers, identifies, and detects innovative molecules from marine microorganisms. The cybersecurity company Diateam is well known in the sector for providing advice and training on maritime cybersecurity. The IMT Atlantique offers a specialist master's course in this subject. It is jointly run with other major local institutions and trains a large cohort of students every year. Dual-use innovation projects, which have both civilian and military applications, are supported by many different local organizations. These include major commercial groups like Tullus, startups such as Mapham Geophysics and Higher Education, and research institutions like Ensta Britannia. Last, but by no means least, scientific communication and outreach are at the heart of what we do. The Musée de la Marine shares information on maritime history. Oceanopolis highlights biodiversity and the all-new Gallery of Marine Innovation, 70.8 showcases marine science and technology. Our approach centers around all these areas of expertise and many more. We organize events in France, Europe, and further afield, where we share our knowledge and expertise. Ocean Hackathon is a non-stop, 48-hour event where teams develop a prototype and investigate its possible uses while enjoying unique access to a range of marine digital data. Breast's biennial Sea Tech Week brings together scientific experts and professionals from ocean-related fields to explore a specific topic. As a result of these and other initiatives taken by our members, we've developed strong international partnerships, including with the United Kingdom, Spain, India, and Canada, especially Quebec. Why not be a part of this dynamic network? Join us in finding ways to make tomorrow's oceans more sustainable. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, just so um, this community, Campus Mer, is uh, the first community devoted to uh, the understanding and developing marine resources. Uh, you can see, oh, is there is a the microphone uh, which is not muted? So, okay, thank you. Uh, and you can see uh, facts and figures here on this slide. So uh, about uh, um, uh, 40,000 jobs and uh, more than 2,000 uh, and, uh, and, um, and 500 organizations. Uh, there, there are, it includes also research centers, but also academics, large company and a smaller one and uh, startups, for example. So you can see here um, different uh, logos of uh, different organizations, but it's not uh, um, uh, the final list. <laughs> um, just to, to continue so about uh, our areas of excellence, um, uh, some are based on established uh, uh, historical um, domains, so for example, the, the defense, but also uh, fishing or oceanography. And uh, um, uh, by crossing these different uh, uh, um, expertise and uh, due to interdisciplinarity, it appeared uh, new uh, sectors, uh, for example, marine biotechnologies, um, but also marine drones, uh, cyber security, uh, or um, uh, uh, expertise in, uh, in the space sector. So, our ambition is to, to give a, a response to the challenges of sustainable development in the, the blue economy and also to make Brest and Brittany one of the most important places for the study and, and the promotion uh, of the, the ocean and a, a strong maritime economy. 
So to do that, we have two uh, roles. So the first one is to uh, straighten connection between this community, the players of this community. So it includes students, researchers, businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, and we want to, to create a, a community of talented individuals um, and they drive new ideas and opportunities for collaboration. And the, the second role is to promote this community at the international levels uh, and so to impulse new activities, uh, growth and attractiveness. So, for example, we, we have a, a collaboration with uh, Canada, with the Norway, the UK, uh, and of course with India. So, to, I would like to focus on, on four uh, of our actions, so very briefly. So, the first one is a, a very concrete uh, action be, because it's a, a portal, an online portal dedicated to marine research infrastructures and facilities. Um, so, it provides uh, an up to date inventory uh, of facilities, platforms, and uh, national research infrastructures. Uh, and it covers all areas of uh, marine science and technology. You can see, for example, uh, vessels and autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, but also laboratory equipment, observation systems, or um, database and uh, high performance computer, and so on. Um, the, the, these facilities are operated by both businesses and public body, bodies uh, and they are uh, available open for research collaboration, a partnership or of course service provision. So you can see on our website uh, this, uh, this portal. Um, a second uh, focus uh, is the uh, expertise desk. Uh, so uh, maybe you, you would like to develop a new cooperation or to develop a new project or just to interview an expert of our community. So you can go to uh, this link and uh, you enter your request. Um, so our objective is to connect uh, you with our expert uh, to, uh, to answer your, your request. Uh, another focus uh, is Hoshan Hackathon, uh, which is a, an event, uh, a very funny and enthusiastic event uh, with many students uh, participating in. Uh, so it's a 40 hours uh, non-stop uh, event to, to tackle uh, challenges by developing uh, a prototype in a team um, and using uh, different uh, marine data um, so this event um, uh, was launched in 2016 and uh, uh, it was originally uh, based in Brest, but it was extended to other, other venues in France, but also at the international. There is this year, there is no edition uh, in Japan, in Sri Lanka or in India, but maybe uh, next year you are welcome to, to join this uh, Ocean Akaton community. Um, so uh, the, uh, it will be the, the, 17, the seventh uh, edition uh, this year in December, um, and uh, there are uh, thirteen cities uh, involved in the, in this uh, uh, this event. And and about the topics, uh, it can be uh, you talk about marine uh, spatial planning, so it's uh, one of the main topic or pollution uh, and especially plastic pollution. The, but also participatory sciences and so on. So, uh, if you are interested in this uh, event, you can contact me, uh, of course. And uh, the last focus uh, is uh, about the international events. Uh, we can help you uh, to organize your event uh, here in Brest. So uh, you are here on this slide, three uh, examples. So the first one uh, was um, a very recent uh, event uh, named the One Ocean Summit organized by the, the French government in January in Brest, a very institutional uh, event. Uh, we are also very proud to uh, welcome next year the European Maritime Days. It will, it will be the, the first time in France and uh, it is an event organized by the European Commission. 
And we also um, support uh, international research conferences. Uh, for example, here, uh, it was in 2019, um, uh, it was the IMBER uh, Open Science Conference, which is a, an international program. Okay, so it was uh, the first part of my, of my presentation, and the second part it's a bit, uh, more focused on the T Tech Week, uh, which is the International uh, Marine Science and Technology Week. Um, it will be in September uh, this year, um, the new edition, and uh, you can see uh, the different patronage. Uh, of the, this event and uh, especially the, the the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So we are very proud to have this uh, uh, this uh, endorsement. So um, this event uh, takes place every every two years uh, in Brest and it provides opportunity for um, a large community of scientists, businesses, cl different clusters, professional clusters and students to share uh, their uh, research and innovation and to develop uh, partnership, collaboration and of course uh, business. Uh, it gathers um, about 1,000 participants um, and 30% uh, from abroad and about 20% of students. So this, uh, this event includes uh, um, a conference. It's uh, the, the central things of, uh, of the, uh, the CTEC weeks, uh, a five days conference with uh, both plenary session, uh, which are a panel discussion, but also uh, technical sessions. So uh, there will be uh, 31 this, this year. There is also uh, an exhibition, is a, a small exhibition about 35 exhibitors and uh, uh, this year uh, there will be also um, two pavilions the first one dedicated to the campus mondial de la mer to uh, promote uh, our expertise uh, but also an indian pavilion managed by fiki um, because uh, india is the is the feature country uh, of this uh, edition and of course you are a uh, different um, uh, opportunity to network uh, with uh, B2B meetings, but also during the social events such as um, the exhibitor cocktail and the gala dinner. So what about the topics uh, this year? The, um, uh, at, do, at each edition, uh, we focus on one main topic, one main theme. So this year it will be maritime transport towards the smarter and greener solutions. And under this uh, main theme, uh, there are uh, uh, different topics. Uh, uh, for example, uh, new fuels, uh, wind propulsion, or uh, boat and IUV design, or um, uh, topics dedicated to ports and to, uh, um, to environment or materials and so on. You, know, you can see the list uh, on this slide and and we will also do two focuses the first one uh, about the the women in marine science and technology and especially um, in maritime transport and the second focus um, uh, on the training and, and career in uh, in marine uh, science and technology and uh, evolutions of, of this uh, uh, of the new uh, new jobs uh, in maritime transport so as i explained before so india is the featured country this year um, and we are very uh, happy and proud to to see that uh, this event in, including in the indo-french roadmap on blue economy and ocean governance and uh, that echoes the GOAT cooperation program initiated by the Campus Mondial de la Mer in uh, 2018 and uh, dedicated to uh, uh, the mobility of students and researchers between uh, our two countries. Uh, so during the the C Tech Week, uh, we normally it's okay. We uh, we should have the the venue of the Indian ambassador ambassador in France, but also the Indian Minister for for shipping, and uh, and uh, different members of FICI. 
Um, we have also uh, two speakers uh, expected in the plenary session. So the uh, the Vice Admiral Amir, our, oh, I'm very sorry for the pronunciation of, of the name. <laughs> uh, so uh, who is the uh, Indian Naval Hydrographic Service and also uh, Mrs. Samit Shima. Kima from uh, uh, Vista India um, regarding uh, uh, especially the, the focus on women in marine science and technology. Um, in the conference, uh, there are uh, uh, 31 uh, technical sessions and um, here are the three, three sessions uh, organized or co-organized by Indian organizations. So uh, the first one uh, concerned the um, Indo-French cooperation in marine sciences, uh, conveyed by the, the French Institute in India, the French Embassy in India, and CRRS India. The second one is a very uh, technical um, about navigation and control of underwater vehicles convened by the Indian Institute of Technology of, in Goa and the National Institute of Technology of Silsha. And uh, another one concerning um, uh, uh, is a workshop, you know, France-India workshop on ocean technology um, convened uh, between uh, if, uh, IFOMER uh, and uh, the NIOT. Uh, okay, so it's, it's uh, the, the last slide. Uh, so if you are interested in the, the CTEC Quick, you, you can go to the website and uh, uh, it's time to register. Uh, and uh, just to, to announce that the Indian delegates can register for, to the event for free and they can use the, the following code. Um, so if you have any question, I, I'm of course at your disposal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Juliet, for sharing a very interactive presentation with us and for explaining to us uh, about the expertise, like your area of expertise and your domain. Uh, thank you very much. Next, we have with us uh, Dr. Tumanaru Akamatsu. Uh, Dr. Akamatsu is currently serving as the Director of Policy Research Department at Ocean Policy Research Institute uh, of uh, Sasawaka Peace Foundation. Uh, his research subjects are biosonar behavior of dolphins and porpoises, passive acoustic monitoring of aquatic animals. He developed various acoustic systems which have been used worldwide to visualize aquatic animals. Uh, today, he will be briefing us on the latest developments in ocean sciences and technology. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, uh, Dr. Akamatsu. Kindly take the stage and share your valuable inputs with us. Hey, thank you for introduction and can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can hear you. Sir. Okay, great, great. And my name is Tomo Akamas from uh, Ocean Research Policy, uh, Ocean Policy Research Institution in Japan. And uh, today I wish to introduce the uh, kind of update technology of the ocean observation and how we can uh, handle the data. And first of all, uh, thank you so much for all of you and all of your government for the deep condolence for the uh, past uh, Shinzo Abe, the president. And um, the assassination is really tragedy for our people. And um, that is a big news. But also another big news may not be uh, uh, let the people internationally know, but we have an election of the upper house about a, a week ago. And um, the, our government going to be very much stable in the next three years. And um, that will probably have a great change and also great progress of a policy making and implementation of the policy ocean policy in the next three years so we are expecting something a big change from japan as well for the next couple of years okay so my presentation is the latest development uh, of the ocean science and technology and i gonna to speak like a three parts how we can obtain the data you know now is a data tsunami uh, as also introduced by like uh, uh, Ocean Hackathon, and that is great, uh, you know, motivation and great activities to how we can handle the data. But initially, we need to get the big data from the ocean, right? And secondly, the, uh, we needed to correct and transmit the data 
to some kind of the data center or hard drive center. So the data creation and data transportation. And the lastly is the data management. So let me start how we can collect the data from the ocean. Yep. And here is the uh, a monitoring station deployed around the ocean and you can see a tens and hundreds of the monitoring station covered in the coastal and OSHA of the uh, Japan waters. And it is mostly because of the earthquake. Uh, we have a big disaster of the earthquake in 2011. And it, this is just in the eastern part of Japan. And uh, we deploy the, uh, uh, you can see the blue dots. It's kind of a line, a thousand of kilometer line to monitoring of the seismic activities as well as the pressure and temperature and also the vibrations. And the red dots are there's a fixed point monitoring station around the coastal area of Japan and applied for the fisheries and also meteorologically and also transportations. And so we have a lots, lots of data uh, sources around Japan. And I think that the situation is the same as India and also same as Sri Lanka or in you know, French and the United States here. And not only for the kind of fixed stations, but also we have a lot of mobile stations. Mobile station means like a underwater airman robot, something like a underwater gliders that is uh, well uh, used very widely these days. And also the wave glider um, that are using for the wave power for the thruster uh, pro propulsion for the back and forth. That, and that is kind of robot uh, already programmed and also something like autonomous uh, functions to explore in the surface of the water and also in the underwater as well. And that's also the Arab uh, introduced the uh, big traffic around India and that also happening in the, all over the world. And uh, you can see a different color of the vessel, for example, like a, a red uh, showing like a, a oil tanker and green showing the cargo ship, and orange showing the, uh, the vessels. Um, okay, yeah, there's a lot of platform or mobile observatories, uh, not only for such kind of special robot, but also the uh, commercial vessels uh, can be an observatory. But, you know, the dense and frequent, frequent observation platforms already exist in Japanese and also the other waters as well. But the issue is they have not been well coordinated. You know, the one platform only for use for the earthscape monitoring. Another platform is only used for the meteorological one. And even for the uh, many of the commercial vessels, uh, only for, to use the transport, the uh, uh, cargoes or no, many, many items, but not be used for the ocean monitoring at all. So let me show some one example how we uh, use the different platform to the other purpose and what we can see. And that is the earthquake cable platform applying for the well monitoring. That is just one example. As I introduced to you, the uh, uh, lots of uh, earthquake monitoring cables deployed in the eastern part of Japan already, and uh, uh, that have a uh, hydrophone accelerometers, and the accelerometers can detect the very much low frequency sound produced by the fin whale, that is the second largest whale in the world. Um, the uh, each dot in the right inset with the figures showing the uh, number of the detected sound in each month and each latitude. As, and you are clearly seeing uh, January, February, March, and December, no, uh, November, December, a uh, lot of the calls are detected. And also that the calls are detected in higher latitude and very uh, relatively less detection in a lower latitude. So this is quite uh, consistent with the previous knowledge. They are uh, migrating to the uh, off Hokkaido area, eastern part of Japan, the northern cold water for uh, breeding. And the male produce this low, real, low frequency sound like a mmm, mmm. And that is clearly detected by the seismic earthquake monitoring system. So that is one of the examples. If we use a one platform 
or the other purposes, or if we would share the platform in the different purposes, that is why not? That's kind of win-win solution for both of us. This is another example for the offshore windmill farm, offshore windmill uh, survey activities. And uh, originally that is used only for the uh, development and of the uh, windmill, but the uh, simultaneously the uh, assessment activities monitor the underwater sound and what we got was the, the sound of the chorus of the fish. I think you can see here this. And here, it is something like a frog, oh, but it is not frog, it's fish. Um, the fish call is uh, quite common in the uh, tropical or warm waters in the summertime and probably in the coastal water of India all year around you can listen this kind of the fish call in the coastal waters. This is only like a one or uh, three weeks monitoring of the underwater and can see clearly all the uh, fish call daily basis in the night time. So based on the uh, platform of the windmill then we can see fish resources. Uh, we apply that kind uh, of monitoring effort in the uh, east of Tokyo, about one, 100 kilometers of Tokyo, uh, face the Pacific Ocean. 20 sites of the accuracy monitoring stations reveal their distribu acoustic distribution of fish, but not only the fish, but also shrimp, as uh, lots of you know, something shrimp noise exists in the ocean that Anlab already. Uh, introduced <clears throat> and also the high frequency ultrasonic sound from the porpoises could be detected to similar uh, acoustic recorders. <clears throat> so we don't need to catch, we don't need to see it, we just keep listening. But the recording the data can reveal the uh, density and distribution of these three completely different animals and also can show a daily basis difference of the distribution. You can see the movement, moving of this color of the figure that the one figure showing each day. So different, the, it's kind of day by day distribution of the uh, can fish porpoises and the, the shrimp. Okay, so I introduced you just multi-use of the platform that is quite productive. So that is kind of why not solution. Uh, not just the correcting the data, sensing the data, but also we need to transmit the data for appropriate correction of that uh, collection of the data. And um, in that case, we need a low cost or even free the satellite or even the different uh, route of the communication. And also seamless networking is necessary. Again, back to the kind of AIS uh, data. The AIS, you may know, the automatic identification system for ships. And we, we can see the location and type of ship and the heading and speed of the ship uh, just you know, clicking internet and that can uh, identify the each ship uh, uh, information very much easily these days. So that is a strong, powerful uh, aspect of the AIS. But there is one drawback. The AIS is only one way. So from the ship to the satellite or from the ship to the land. Um, that, that is, oh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm this, my name is now, blah, 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 blah. So that, that is basically one way uh, to correct the, the, uh, uh, the data. But in these days, the uh, kind of bimodal you know, uh, communication is quite important, not only from the ship to the land, but also land to the ship. It's kind of vice versa communication is quite important for the data correction and also the commanding of the sensor. And now the uh, AIS system going to be a second generation, we are calling that like AIS 2.0. Or uh, some of you may know about that. <clears throat> this data uh, terms of VDIS is based uh, uh, on the VHF data exchange system. And that, that is a second generation of the uh, AS technology. And the, uh, that is really <clears throat> powerful and redundant system. Uh, it, it's also the bimodal communication. <clears throat> So that ensures not only from the ship to the land station, but also the ship to the uh, satellite, or even the ship to ship hopping to the satellite and back to the land station. 
So this is something like a、uh, you know ocean internet, especially for the IoT, Internet of the Things. And、um, you may be you know notice about that. Okay, the Elon Musk. Uh, develop the、uh, Starlink system that's going to be available、uh, in India and、uh, it's just available for Japan in this month. Okay, but the,、uh, that, the AI system does not any conflict with the Starlink because the Starlink is using a relatively big、uh, antenna and ensure the broadband. And also, it's, it's also still some cost.、Uh, the, the ocean IoT does not need such broadband. It's just a packet communication between、uh, the, the ship or any kind of object from the ocean to the data center. That is good enough. And、um, the AIS,、uh, no, the VDIS system, is going to be、uh, covering all over the globe, probably within 10 years or maybe earlier, like、uh, five years.、Uh, we, we mean、uh, many of the countries. Are now struggling and also pushing for that video system、uh, going to be a big、uh, infrastructure, communication infrastructure in the ocean.、Uh, not only for uh, the, uh, the, the previous、uh, Stenera, that is the Danish、uh, company, but also Japanese Arc Edge Space Company, also are scheduled to launch、uh, the <clears throat> orbit demonstration、uh, within like two years. And one is a benefit of such a, a kind of the bimodal communication. It's the simple example is to avoid the fishing gear, like a troll net or like a, a seine net, and a fishing boat and the big net behind of the boat. And generally, the、uh, fishing boat d o not want to locate. Delocated, or even the fishing gear do not have any information、uh, of the location and cannot be identified digitally. If the large container vessel may be across with the、uh, behind with the fishing boat, and some many many accidents to cut that kind of rope and the, the nets. Um, no, before or even currently, most of the、uh, large vessel is dependent on the watch. The human effort to watch around. But it is not really you know, efficient.、Uh, it is efficient, but it's not really you know,、uh, you know, smart. The, if we have like a, a digital communication and digital、uh, identification for any of the objects, not including,、uh, including not only for the fishing boat, but also the,、uh, the fishing gear. The, and the, even the computer between two vessels can communicate each other automatically. Then the large vessel knew that, okay, there is a fishing gear s、uh, in front of them,、uh, ahead of them, and to、uh, en route to avoid that the collision with the fishing、uh, gears. And also, that is happening for the uh, uh, passing by the small boat by the large vessel. And that is also very much common in the maritime. And for the maritime security, mostly depending on the watch or the boss of the vessel. But that also can be navigated digitally. You know, the digital navigation is quite common in the aircraft. And also, that's going to be common in cars and land transportation. s But that will be happening for the maritime uh, you know, the transportation very soon. So, finally, let me introduce the、uh, all objects in the ocean will be monitored and managed digitally using global packet communication network that will be called in the satellite and a general VHF data exchange system, VDIS system. And what, what is good is, for example, like Amand Cargo.、Uh, Amand Cargo will be going to be of,、uh, common in the next. Two decades, or even like after three decades, many of the cargo ships are going to be unmanned. So, in that case, a risk management and a coordinated crews、uh, definitely need some、uh, bimodal communication between s h i p and between the land station to the ship. And also, the offshore w i n d m i l l farm, that is main, the great effort for the maintenance is needed. So, not only for the uh, uh, you know, electric generation, but also the men,、uh, monitoring of the, each blade of the windmill, or even the basement and the environment around of the、uh, offshore wind. And men, the fish resource management that is the,、uh, done by the vessel monitoring system currently. 
and that will be replaced by the uh, satellite video system. And also the uh, uh, fishery certification that is the uh, something like a uh, certificate to uh, catch the fish appropriately without any uh, you know, violence of the local regulations and blah, blah, blah. Then environmental assessment and disaster prevention or distress on safety. I don't get into de detail about that. Uh, the ocean IOT will enables us this kind of the management and security much, much easier and immediately, uh, probably within several years. Okay, so I will quit my talk and data archive and classification. The third point I wish to talk about in the different uh, opportunities and that needs a lot of effort and also the system and the satellite video system also will be constructing some kind of an international data center to uh, manage and monitor and also keep uh, ensure the security of the data in the future. And we are also uh, encouraging the IARA, the international uh, <clears throat> organization for the uh, maritime uh, <clears throat> navigations uh, to uh, promote this kind of data center in the several next uh, years. So thank you so much. My That is my whole presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tom, for sharing such valuable insights with us. Uh, your thoughts have definitely guided us in the right direction, and it has led us to ponder more about the potential scope in the area. Uh, also, thanks for making us uh, aware of the technical and scientific side during today's webinar. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'd like to thank all the parties, all the panelists for sharing such worthy points and for apprising us for today's uh, topic. Uh, now, before we move on to the next uh, section of this uh, webinar, I'd like to gently uh, call uh, our panelists of today to write to us for the UDA Digest e-magazine, which is uh, a platform where the experts in the domain, in the maritime domain, they come and they contribute in the form of uh, articles and short videos. Uh, so uh, like, I'd like to ask the panelists to write to us for that. And you can share your articles with Arnab sir or directly with me so that we can have your opinion on the other platforms that we have at Maritime Research Center. Uh, now, I'd like to open the stage for healthy inter interjections. Uh, this is a Q&A session and should go on for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Would request the audience to pose their questions and allow the esteemed panelists to respond to them in stipulated time for smooth functioning of this webinar. So, uh, whoever has questions can please uh, pose the same. Even comments from the audience is most welcome. Okay, so in that case, I'd like Arnab sir to talk a little bit more to the audience and to the panelists who are here. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I think we've had a very good panel today, uh, a wide spectrum of views and ideas, uh, and that's what makes it uh, richer. And I think as uh, all the panelists also acknowledge, there is a huge requirement of uh, generating the underwater domain awareness uh, and a lot of collaboration is required. Uh, we try to bring together uh, different speakers with uh, diverse backgrounds. Uh, uh, a senior diplomat uh, with a very deep understanding of blue economy and the maritime uh, domain, who has been involved in various uh, very top level decision making. Then we had a very senior bureaucrat uh, involved in uh, innovation earlier because he had in his earlier uh, appointment he, he was involved and uh, then now he is in a very, very important position of capacity building. Uh, then we had uh, uh, Professor Ratnayake from Sri Lanka. Uh, I mean, an academic uh, with a huge experience behind 
uh, and also uh, deeply involved in uh, sustainability. And uh, thank you very much, sir, for your very uh, insightful presentation. Uh, then we had a, a, a slightly different track in terms of um, uh, our friend from Brest talking about uh, uh, innovation and how uh, you know they are seeking international collaboration or facilitating international collaboration to bring more innovation into the ocean and the maritime domain. And then, of course, my friend uh, Tom Akamatsu from uh, Tokyo, I mean, they, uh, he has been uh, himself deeply involved in research and not just in Japan, but all over the world. He has spent enough time in India as well, uh, involved in very critical projects. Uh, that's how we met each other, uh, uh, the Freshwater Dolphin Project. And uh, he gave us a very good insight into how cutting a technology is being uh, uh, worked upon and uh, being delivered uh, uh, in uh, Japan and to the rest of the world. Uh, thank you so much. I think I will quickly request uh, our speak, uh, panelists also to give their quick uh, comment on uh, uh, the webinar and uh, uh, having heard uh, the uh, conversation, uh, starting with Ambassador Mudgal, sir. Uh. Arnab, in fact, the Q&A session is an indication that we are talking about something very, very new. Which means uh, people are still not really embedded into this new idea. And that is where, in fact, your responsibility enhances. Uh, we mentioned about, say, generating awareness, advocacy. You see, my problem, I know, whenever I talk about blue economy or uh, sustainability in general, you see, when I see the ordinary person simply does not fully appreciate what exactly we mean by sustainability. And in fact, I have been arguing in all my meetings, please take it to the starting point of life. Take it to schools. Let the children start thinking sustainably, right? You know, when we do something, do we ever think of its impact on environment? We never think. There may be one in a million who thinks it. But a majority simply doesn't think over it. We are taking environment for granted. And my worry is that we have, we are all, we, though we don't realize, but we are paying heavy price for environmental degradation. Now, if we don't stop, and if we continue with, with uh, the way we have dealt with environment in the past, I think now we are reaching a critical point of no return. And that is why the international community is calling global warming as an existential threat. They don't take it lightly. If it, if it materializes, it would be very close to an existential threat. So I think sooner we get to this point, better for all of us. And I wish you all the best, Arnav. You are doing a wonderful job. And your institute is doing a wonderful job. It's an uphill task. It's not going to be easy. It will be very frustrating. But I'm sure you're a resilient person, right? Uh, I have been, as I say, I have been arguing this for last almost eight years. Even before, when I was not dealing with VE, blue economy, I'm, I'm a man from uh, conservation. I have uh, my basic education in uh, uh, biological sciences. So I understand what kind of implications it could have. And therefore, I sincerely appear worried. Right? So I'm sure... The answer to my worries in is in in hands like yours. So play it carefully so that we are able to overcome these worries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> definitely, sir. We are definitely in it for a long haul, and we are not going to give up. Definitely. Uh, 
next, uh, if I can request uh, uh, Tom, uh, your views. Okay, thank you so much for uh, giving me a very much great opportunities and I also answered several questions on chat box. And, you know, the uh, Alab already uh, mentioned about the underwater um, no, uh, domain awareness. That is the uh, kind of the last challenging pioneer area. The sea surface can be organized, uh, can be monitored relatively easily, even using a satellite system. But underwater, that is quite important. So this seminar is quite, uh, I think the, I learned a lot for how we can manage and how we can see the underwater system and how we can you know, study that kind of phenomena. So thank you so much for organizing and thank you so much for you know, giving a very much nice talk in this evening. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah. Professor, thank you, sir. I think we we have lost connectivity with him. Uh, Arun Saigal, sir, would you like to say something? I Sorry, I don't have very good connectivity, but I can only say that all those items, all those points which have been covered, I can tell you that the spatial knowledge and the digital ocean knowledge is very essential from the point of view of my own experience when uh, trying to locate not only an underwater target or some other item under the sea, because I have been in the Navy looking for submarines, both peacetime and during wartime, and also I'm a qualified diver. So the knowledge which I'm gaining today, I wish I had it over 50 years ago. Thank you so much for inviting me to attend this webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Juliet, uh, any comments from you? Uh, yes, so thank you. So uh, I just uh, notice that uh, uh, the Indian Ocean is, is seems to be very far from France, but uh, but uh, there are many similarities in terms of uh, of topics of uh, expertise like marine spatial planning or acoustics and so on. So uh, it's uh, very interesting to to see that, and uh, I hope to to see you again uh, at Sea Week in September. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sunil Shatsi, sir, uh, thank you for joining us. Would you like to say something? That's that's very kind of you, Arnab, uh, to ask me to say say a few words. Uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed the, uh, the seminar and the contributors. Uh, I, I just want to make a very general remark for the participants and for the for the panel as well. Uh, and the general remark is about, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always got this thought in my mind, and this has been recently reiterated by uh, Lubchenko, uh, you know, uh, from the uh, NOAA, uh, former NOAA, NOAA scientist, head di director or whatever, director general of NOAA. And she has articulated this in, uh, very well, and let me try to sort of recapitulate and say what she says. And she says that our narrative has to change as far as the ocean is concerned. You know, our narratives so far have been wrong. The first, first narrative is that we have oceans. We always talk of oceans, you know, seven oceans, five oceans, three oceans, but there is only one ocean. So that's the first narrative that has got to change. That, that's, and we have to, uh, we have to look at the, uh, look at the new, new projection. Uh, that has come out of the ocean, uh, of the ocean, which is Antarctica centered. The center of the world is Antarctica, not, not Eurocentric or not US centric, but it's the Antarctica as a center. And if you look at the map of the world, then, then it is only one ocean. You can see a big, huge ocean there. Land bodies are in fact very small. Just to, just to give an example, the Pacific ocean itself, we talk of Indo-Pacific. The Pacific is bigger than all the continents combined together. You know, it can accommodate all the all the continents. The Pacific, you can put six moons side by side, and the Pacific is still bigger. You know, or you you take the entire area of Mars. You know, our 
uh, our billionaire uh, people are trying to go to Mars, etc. There is no second planet. There is no plan B. There is only one planet and this is the planet, you know. So the area of Mars is smaller than that of the area of Pacific. You know, so that's one narrative that we have to think of. So it has got to be one ocean. That's one narrative. The second thing she, she talks about is that our old narrative was that the oceans are too big to fail. You know, this is like the big banks that they talked about in 2008 and all that, that this is too big to fail. So they save protect. But ocean is not too big to fail. We have found out that ocean is not too, too big to fail. We have made it fail. We have we have failed it, you know. So the second narrative came. And this is a defeatist narrative and it says the ocean is too big to fix, you know. And that is also a wrong narrative. You know, ocean is not too big to fix. And the third narrative, which is the correct narrative, and that correct narrative is that ocean is too big to ignore. The ocean is too big to ignore. And we ignore it at our own peril. And as one of your panelists said, that we know only 5% of the ocean, 5% of the ocean has been mapped. So unless we know more about the ocean and unless we, we are able to find out what the ocean needs from us, because we are not saving the ocean, we are saving the humankind. We want to save ourselves, it's completely anthropocentric, you know, and that is what it is. So my, my general point would be just this, that one ocean and our narrative has to change. Thank you very much for the opportunity. As always, I enjoy your webinars and attending them. And I'd be happy to contribute in, in a future webinar whenever the opportunity arises. Uh, and of course, you know, it's always great to interact with you, Arnav. Thank you so much, sir. I can see Professor Nand Kumar, sir. Any comments from you? Professor Nand Kumar, sir. Okay, I think Nishta, we can close uh, if there are no comments. Sure, sir, sure. Uh, now that we've come to the concluding section of uh, today's agenda, I would like to propose a vote of thanks to all of you who have joined us today. Uh, it is my absolute privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of those who have joined us today and have uh, uh, contributed towards this webinar. Uh, on behalf of Maritime Research Center, which is a technology-driven think tank and is dedicated towards the promotion of underwater domain awareness framework, I would like, like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest. Your thoughts have definitely enlightened us and have guided us uh, to a new path. Sincere th thanks to the core team at MRC for pulling this off and for handling the event throughout. Thanks to all the participants who've joined us uh, on a, uh, like different platforms on WebEx and on YouTube. Uh, thank you and have a nice day.